We know that we have civilians that are scared. No matter what Israel has to do to wipe out Hamas. South Florida's war front. There shall be no ceasefire and we must get our hostages back. The pain, the isolation and fear. Support money. Our citizens are still on edge. And this week, a state special session. It's important to fight. And if you don't have the stomach for these fights, you probably find another line of work. And we hit him hard and now he's like a wounded falling bird from the skies. The presidential debate comes to town as the front runner goes across town, all eyes on Florida this week, and a lot on the plate for the round table this time, what the youngest voters want you to know. The big news of the week and the newsmakers live this week in South Florida. Good morning. Hello, hello. I'm Glenna Milberg. We start today with your money. More than 14 billion U.S. dollars in emergency funding to back Israel's war on terrorists and rescue hostages, including Americans. The House voted to send it and pay for it by diverting the money that would have funded Internal Revenue Service improvements. And that left South Florida Democrats with a tough decision. And all but one joined Republicans in voting yes. But the Senate has said, forget it, dead on arrival, so now what? That is where we start with one of our local congressmen who holds the power of the purse as an appropriator. Mario diaz Balart here with us live via Zoom. You're kind of a regular. I'm, I'm liking this, Congressman. Good morning. Well, thank you, Glenn. A lot is happening in D.C. these days. A lot is happening in D.C. with such resonance in South Florida, and that's what we talk about. And so to start that off, you considered this aid package, so many considered this aid package, a critical emergency funding, um, and including South Florida Democrats, 12 Democrats voted for this, including South Florida's, but for one. Uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, your colleague, was one of those Democrats. However, while voting for it, she called it, I'm going to quote her here, a gross politicization and unprecedented conditioning of aid to Israel. How do you hear that? Well, look, we, we have a, it was, it received the bipartisan support in the House, and this is what the bill does. It, it, it funds exactly what Israel is asking us to fund that they need urgently. It's exactly what it funds. Now, I, I guess the controversial part for some is that as opposed to just borrowing money, you know, adding this to the deficit and then basically borrowing the money from China and having to pay interest on that money, we're trying to actually reduce spending someplace else in order to pay for this. I don't think that's that complicated of an issue. One could argue that maybe it's the not the ideal place or it is the ideal place uh, to cut in order to not have to borrow more money from China. But the concept, I think, is a great one. We're funding Israel exactly what they need and what they've asked for. And we're trying not to just add to the deficit. We're looking at ways to cut spending elsewhere. In this case, cutting a, a, a almost 90,000 additional um, IRS bureaucrats, which have not been hired, shouldn't be hired. I think that's a pretty good trade-off between having to borrow more money from China and having to pay interest on that money or Let's not hire almost 90,000 more IRS bureaucrats in order to pay for this. That's the entire controversy. So that the, the IRS funding was politics from the start. We've actually talked about it last year when this had bubbled up. Um, for two questions on that account. How did that pot of money get to be the one? Um, as I don't, aside from borrowing from China, I'm sure there's probably a lot of other options too. So part A, how, why IRS funding? Who, whose idea was that? Yeah, I mean, Glenn, I think there are other places that we can look for. And if you look at my state foreign ops operation uh, appropriation bill that passed the House, you look, you see that we found other places to to cut a wasteful spending. But here's the reality. There's a big chunk of money that hasn't been spent um, that is programmed to hire almost 90,000 additional IRS bureaucrats. And we believe that we shouldn't be doing that in the first place, that that's going to hurt the taxpayers, particularly small businesses and families. So it's a great place to not waste money and use it for something that's an emergency, which is this money for uh, Israel. Now, are there right, other well, before, places? Before you go on, hold on, hold on. I have a question before you, before you go on on that account. I, I read the analysis by the Congressional Budget Office, non, nonpartisan, bipartisan. Their analysis of that, they don't call it 90,000 bureaucrats. They call it modernization that would actually 
decrease the deficit in the long run because modernizing and technology at IRS allows them to go after tax cheats and bring in more money. So that, that's what the, the sort of facts say on the analysis. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Only in Washington are 90,000 additional bureaucrats called modernization. Only in Washington. So IT is not part of that? Technology? IT is, is a small part of that, but it's 90,000, I think it's 89,000 new IRS bureaucrats. And only in Washington is that called modernization. And by the way, or called savings which is absolutely insane. Look, I, I'm not new at this. Um, uh, you have to have a little bit of common sense when you're dealing with Washington. And I think common sense and the American people know that if you hire an additional 90,000 bureaucrats in the IRS, number one, they are there forever. You're never gonna be able to get rid of them. Um, it's gonna continue to increase cost. And calling that efficiency or modernization is only a reality that can happen in the vivid imagination of other bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So how do you go after those tax cheats and get all that money back? We're doing that already. And what, what this is meant to do, and by the way, we've seen reports saying this, is to go after small businesses and families and, and you know family farms in particular, and again, individuals and in in small businesses. This is not to go after the big corporations, which by the way, we need to make sure that they pay their fair share. This is to go after, again, to, to audit additional families, small businesses, individuals, and again, at a huge cost to the taxpayer. The theory is that they're gonna be able to find enough money going after small businesses and individuals and families in order to make up the cost to hire 90,000 more bureaucrats, again, Common sense will tell you it's not true. But again, we can say that maybe we should look for other places. I've done that effectively looking for other places to cut spending, but we need to find, we needed to find it quickly. That money has not been spent yet. And we need to make sure that Israel gets everything, everything it needs. And I, I, I by the way, I expect that this won't be the only time that we're gonna have to help Israel to deal with this war against terrorists. So that's an open question, absolutely. Um, I want to, Congressman, another huge international news that is huge local news this week that I don't think we've given enough attention to here was the what happened with the elections in Venezuela. There was sort of this local news about the Biden administration's deal to loosen sanctions on oil, uh, oil sanctions on Venezuela and the Maduro regime in return for uh, election monitoring and fair elections. Um, that kind of was heralded as a breakthrough deal by some. And then it appears this week that Maduro reneged on that. We are, uh, your observations there. I, I warned the administration publicly, privately, and even in writing that, that this was, it was a ludicrous idea. You don't uh, relax sanctions, hoping that Maduro will have free elections. You keep sanctions and you pressure uh, until they have free elections. So by the way, I'm demanding already, and I've had multiple conversations with this administration, that they snap back those uh, unilateral sanction relief that they gave Ma the Maduro dictatorship. It was in oil and in oil and in gold. By the way, the only beneficiaries are the allies of Iran and Russia and China, and obviously our enemies. But this administration, the Biden administration, their decisions have been so erroneous, so naive since the beginning that we should not be surprised that the world is up in flames. It's falling apart around us. A big part of that is because of the frankly ridiculously naive or irresponsible uh, foreign policy of the Biden administration. Congressman Mario diaz Balart, great to have you for uh, our short time together on this Sunday. And we absolutely will be watching what happens with the funding and the foreign policy as we go forward this week. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lena. And next, taking it to the state level, Israel is on the agenda for lawmakers. State lawmakers headed to special session right to Tallahassee this week. And so are two other of Florida's pressing needs. And that's next. Four days, 
five topics, one more special session this week with much of the focus on the Florida front of Israel's war on Hamas terror. Money for security, sanctions against Iran-based companies. Add to that bills funding home hurricane hardening and things like school vouchers. And some of those bills are being carried by South Florida senators and reps. Two are here live with us to take the dive into the details. State Representative Michael Gottlieb, Democrat, repping Central Broward right here at the table with us. State Senator Alexis Kaladiud, Republican, repping Southeast Miami-Dade on Zoom. Hello, everybody, and thanks so much for being with us in this conversation. Thanks for having me. Good morning, Glenna. Thanks for having us. Good morning, Alexis. I want to start with you because you are sponsoring one of the bills. The security grants is the title on the bills. Incidentally, everyone can look them up and read the bills right there online as we talk. Um, this it actually goes to its first committee tomorrow. This is looks like it's, a, it's going to be a speedy, a speedy time. Grants for nonprofits, schools and the like, museums that are considered high risk for terror attacks and hate crimes. I explain that pot of money and why that might be necessary since I, I believe they're already part uh, funding for those kind of things already. Thank you for the question, Glenna. The Florida State Nonprofit Security Grant Program is a parallel to the federal nonprofit security grant program. I created it this past legislative session with unanimous support from the House and the Senate with my colleague Randy Fine. And so this is for additional funding because we found a gap between what our communities needed of our, our faith, our religious, our ethnic and cultural communities needed for their support. This, fam uh, this fund was created this past legislative session and now we are fully funding. So we are investing $10 million into the Nonprofit Security Grant Fund, which focuses both on hardening measures and security personnel measures, $20 million in Jewish family day schools and preschools for security personnel, and $5 million for Jewish day schools and preschools for intentional structural hardening. So as long as we are all together here having this conversation, we get a, an idea of how Democrats in the House and Senate are looking at that kind of idea, because I think it, Israel, anti-Semitism, protecting people, hate crime, th this is a bipartisan thing here. Absolutely, I expect yeah. this bill to pass um, without much debate. Uh, the program's open essentially to anybody who, who's running any kind of house of worship or school with young children. Um, but as you mentioned, um, anti-Semitism is on the rise. It was up 40% last year and is up over 400% this year since the October 7th attack. So I think that this bill is very timely and is very needed. I'm really looking forward to voting yes on it. Senator, would that money also be available to non-Jewish institutions who can show a, a credible fear of that kind of thing? Great question. This program was actually created in collaboration with multiple faith communities. And the vision was to make sure that we not just created this fund and provided funding inside of it, but we worked with different faith communities, different cultural communities to encourage them to learn how to apply and to participate. Our vision here was for this to be ecumenical in that sense. And unfortunately, after the October 7th massacre and the Hamas terrorist activity, we're seeing an even heightened intensity of anti-Semitic action. And so with that full view of opening for the full community, we now see so much more anti-Semitism plaguing the nation and the world. And so it's become so much more pressing a need to increase the, dramatically increase the funding. You know, while we're talking about this, I want to kind of go rogue for a moment. I just thought of something. Uh, Representative Randy Fine was with, actually here with us last week. Uh, he is the co-sponsor on this particular bill. And he was talking about how he has switched his endorsement from Governor Ron DeSantis for uh, president to Donald Trump for president for the reason that he didn't think the governor was taking a strong enough public vocal stance condemning anti-Semitism. Uh, in words as well as deeds, and I wonder what you think of that. Thanks for asking, Lena. I'm proud to say that Governor DeSantis has supported all of this policy. I worked with uh, Representative Fine on our strengthening of the criminal and civil penalties for hate crimes. 
this past legislative session, as well as this policy. And I believe we're taking incredibly intentional steps in the state of Florida, and the governor has supported those steps to make this state, at this moment especially, the safest place to openly practice your religion and celebrate your religious and ethnic community. Right now, Florida is endeavoring to make our state the second safest place in the world for the Jewish people. And I think in large part, that's to thank the governor. So you're talking action. Uh, Randy Fine was talking words. What, what do you think about that? I think the governor's history of not condemning the Nazis in, in Tampa and the hate groups that came to Tampa are the kind of things that, that um, Representative Fine is talking about. I think the governor was a little slow to action to call this special section and to condemn the atrocities committed by Hamas um, uh, you know, against Israel. So I, I think that's why you, he- I'm sorry, you thought he was slow to call the session? Well, I want to make sure I heard that right. Yeah, I mean, he he called the session relatively quickly, but he didn't. You were asking about his words. You yeah. know, he he didn't what condemn Randy it. Fine had said yes. correct. Yeah. You know, he. Um, we were up there um, right after October seventh, so we're coming up there a month later. So i um, You know, maybe you think that's quickly, but I don't necessarily think that's quickly. I think that there are times that we need to take immediate action. Um, so I think a 30 day period of time, you know, I, I would agree with Representative Fine that the governor didn't do enough as quickly as he could have or should have to make people feel safe and secure in the state of Florida. Uh, just for the record, what I think doesn't matter here. I just asked the questions. Well, I you're a voter, so it does. <laughs> <laughs> Not at this table. I wanted to ask you about the uh, one of the other bills called scrutinized companies. Let me let me throw this one to you first. Scrutinized companies redesignates what is also uh, an existing program that sanctions companies who invest in, do business with Iran and its oil and energy sector. It, isn't the state of Florida and the uh, layer of federal oversight have that already, does it not? How is this different? Right, I think to a certain extent um, it does, and it also prevents the state of Florida from making investments in those companies. So I think what it is, is a, it's, a, it's a second look to ensure that the money that we're spending, that our tax dollars, aren't going to Hamas um, because we've seen that we've provided them with millions, if not billions of dollars in infrastructure money that hasn't gone to infrastructure. It's gone to commit, you know, acts of terrorism and acts of, um, you know, uh, atrocity. So I think what we're doing is making sure that the people of Florida's money is going to be invested wisely and that we're going to be not encouraging money to be used. Um, and it's only money over a million dollars. I don't know how many um, is, you know, uh, Iranian um, gas companies there are that are doing business in the state of Florida. Th so that actually was my <laughs> next question. Senator, do you know, are you on board with this? And do you know at the practical effects of this? Like Representative Gottlieb, I'm not um, aware of the exact number of organizations that are doing business currently with Iranian companies. But I feel that anything that we can do to limit the funding that Iran has to continue their work around the world, the world, supporting Hamas, supporting Hezbollah, increasing Hezbollah's activity in Latin America, across the world. These people have supported the initiation of brutal terrorist war in the Middle East. They have siphoned off the opportunity for further Middle Eastern peace and are doing everything they can to put barriers between one of the United States' closest allies and security in a region that we deeply believe security is in our national interest for. I, I, I believe I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt. I, I just want to, um, this is how television goes. I need to hit the break, but <laughs> if you sit tight for a couple of minutes, I, uh, I sure do want to come right back because we have some other bills, much more locally practical to talk about when we come right back. Stay tuned. We are back with State Representative Michael Gottlieb right here at the table, State Senator Alexis Kaladiud with us via Zoom talking about the special session coming up, uh, two of the non-Israel related bills coming up. And let's talk about the first one, My Safe Florida Home, a hurricane hardening program is part of a bill, a larger bill that's going to be funding more hurricane relief, largely for Idalia victims. But uh, Michael Gottlieb, My Safe Florida Home, which was touted as one of the programs to 
circumvent damage and lower property insurance premiums ran out of money pronto because so many people wanted to use it. So this invests more, I think like a quarter of the half billion is going into it. Is that enough and is that sustainable? Well, the good thing is um, we've got a very robust economy here in the state of Florida and we have a lot of money. We have a $115 billion budget typically. And I think with this bill, we're, we're dedicating another $181.5 million to the My Safe Home project. So if it's not enough, We've got a session coming up in January, and I'm sure we'll appropriate more if it's needed. But I'm glad to see that Floridians are taking advantage of it, that they're hardening their homes, and that they're getting money back from the government that is proactive so that we don't have to spend it. Hopefully there are no hurricanes that cause damage, but so that we don't have to spend it in the in the end and we can save people's homes. Senator, do you um, the are you convinced that this isn't just going to be like a black hole of money? One of, one of the uh, criticisms of the reason hurricane premiums, storm premiums are so high is because of fraud and people taking advantage. Are you convinced that this program is airtight enough and planable enough to really work the way it's supposed to? I'm very excited about the My Safe Florida Home Program. And I think it's been an incredible opportunity for homeowners to be able to take the next steps in protecting their home and hardening their home with the best technology that we have. and. It's really exciting to see, as Representative Gottlieb said, the aggressive nature that, that local Floridians are finding ways to take advantage of these programs. I can also think of the Hometown Heroes programs that helps first time home buyers in Florida step into their first home with a 0% interest, $35,000 loan for down payment assistance. We've got $100 million already in the hands of Floridians within three months time. These Is that yeah, and, and these, I mean, the programs are wonderful and helpful. Yeah. And I, I guess my real question is, I, in reading the bill, it does seem to allocate some resources to go after assuring that the people who are getting the money deserve it and need it. Are you confident that that is airtight enough uh, for preventing fraud, theft, waste? We're learning every day, just as fraudsters and criminals are learning new ways to try to circumvent processes. So I believe that we get better and better all the time in understanding how people are trying to jump loopholes and take financial advantage of governments, uh, whether that's cyber or that's completely through application process. We learn every day how to get better at that. Are you, um, Representative, are you also convinced that, you know, to, to your point, the economy is good, flush with money. Um, is it sustainable, though? Well, um, I think so. I mean, the weather was great this year. We didn't have, you know, people are still flocking to Florida. Uh, hope and prayer yeah. is, is not a thing. <laughs> uh, and if we, maybe if we stop our fight with Disney, which attracts a lot of people to the state of Florida, we'll continue Oof. to have, yeah, a lot of uh, money in the general <laughs> revenue. I didn't have that one on my bingo <laughs> card here. Yeah. Uh, Senator, I want to talk about the other uh, bill coming up, uh, this special session, is in Florida's in its first year of universal school vouchers. Uh, that a lot of attention toward that. And then the bill that you all will be voting on this week adds a lot more money and takes away the cap on specifically the vouchers that allow $10,000 for students with disabilities. That program mm -hmm. has been there. It has a cap. There's a long waiting line. This week, the cap could be lifted, uh, money added. I guess the same question is, it, to, uh, the state's own anal analysts don't really know how much and how many. Does that concern you? This is a program that's near and dear to my heart. So the unique, uh, unique Abilities Program supports families with children that have uh, disabilities, and that could be very complex disabilities. This funding helps them personalize education. So to me, providing greater and greater access for families to be able to understand how to uniquely support their child, this almost is the most important issue in education, true equity of opportunity for children with special needs. And so I'm excited to move that policy forward and also to work through subsequent legislative sessions to make sure that that is always funded at the need that Floridians have. Do you know how many people, how many families, how much money is, is going to be needed to get rid of that wait list? 
That's the interesting piece. We don't know how many families would like to transition into a different education environment for their child. So this is all market driven or really family driven. So we can't really make that estimation because it's individual choices of families. Interesting. So let me um, get the democratic point of view on that because listen, you know, just from talking to people in office, it is the Republican uh, line that we are fiscal conservatives, we are gonna watch our money. So to hear this kind of thing where this program that is so helpful and critical to so many, there's really no way to know how many and how much. Well, give me your, your take on that. Are you supportive of this? So I am and, supportive and, of this actually. Uh, uh, go ahead, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Just because the technology of this, I wanna be able to make sure someone on Zoom can hear this. Go ahead, Senator. No, and, I, and I'm sorry, and I, and I just want to say um, this is, I believe this is becoming a beautifully bipartisan alignment. Um, you'll see that our upcoming speaker, Miami's own Danny Perez, has made in his opening address as his designation as speaker, supporting people with special needs throughout their lifetime is one of his priorities. So I think you're going to see really beautiful things coming out of the legislature on that front in the next couple of years. I am so down for that. That's a that's amazing. But I, I want to get back to how do you pay for them? And and now the money is there, to your point, um, in perpetuity and sustainability to really provide these families with the help. Are, are you concerned that the the facts of those numbers aren't there or, or not? I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to know how many families are going to have are going to be at the income level to be able to take advantage of this and how many yeah. families have children with unique abilities and, and want to take advantage of it. Um, as a Democrat, we don't love voucher programs because we don't want to see public schools being defunded. But at the same point in time, when you see a program like this and you recognize the benefit that it can give to um, individuals who have these needs to go to a school that's more particularized and it can help mm -hmm. them and it can mainstream them and it can help them get the education that they need. I absolutely 100% favor it. And we'll figure it out as we go along as to how many kids need it and we'll fund it. Uh, well, that sounds like it's gonna be a rockin' week. <laughs> state Rep Michael Gottlieb, State Senator Alexis Kaladi, it's sure great to have you together with us today and I hope you will be back. Absolutely, thanks again. All right. And coming up next, we take it all to this week's roundtable. What do the youngest voters think? That's next. We are taking it all to the roundtable. And at the table this week, the diverse voices of the youngest among us. Let's do some introductions first, shall we? Carlton Gillespie is a digital broadcasting student at Florida International University, involved in local transportation planning and climate change advocacy organizations, and is on the Parks Foundation of Broward Board. Wow. Melanie Lowe is a sophomore honors student at University of Miami, an executive producer for UMTV's The Culture, and an anchor for UMTV's News Vision. Regina Potenza is an honors student at, uh, where, FIU? No, UM. At UM and anchors for UMTV's News Vision as well. She's already working at two sports networks. And we have Tanya Jimenez, who is a, drum roll please, senior about to earn her second degree and is a batch, has a bachelor in psychology from Florida International University. Mm -hmm. So this is fun. You are all journalism students, which, um, which I'm sort of gonna tailor the conversation to, but I, I just wanna throw out there that we have round tables, you've seen them, we've seen them. And this is such an amazing opportunity for viewers to really get a sense of the campus, young people, young voter point of view, which is huge, why? because the numbers of voters who are young are gonna be huge this year. So as the only boy at the table, you get the first question. I wanna, you know, we talked a lot about with the congressmen, with the state reps, um, there's something going on on campuses today relative from October 7th that I wanna get your perspective, your feeling. How is campus life for you? Has it changed? What do you think? Well, campus life has been largely the same for us. Uh, I know, at least in my experience at FIU, yeah. um, certainly there's been a greater push for visibility from both Palestinian and Jewish students. And I think it's kind of a good breeding ground because online we can be very divisive with each other and kind of pick a side that we want to win. But on a campus, it's such a collaborative space where people can come together and, and hash out their differences. And I think that's really going to be the key to the problem 
Is that right? That, that's interesting perspective. I think it, from the news point of view, when we kind of dip into what's going on, I'm, I'm not sure people see that. Melanie, what do you think? I think this is a unique opportunity for people on college campuses specifically because this issue is something that does affect people that are at the younger ages, even though it's kind of happening overseas. And you would think that most people on college campuses think these are older people in charge of what's going on. This doesn't affect me. But it feels a little bit more personal for people here at home because you're seeing friends, families affected by these things. And it's kind of divisive. These Having these kind of issues happen on the college campus is really conducive to having these types of conversations for young people. I think it's especially um, beneficial for these people to be thinking about how their role on campus is important their voices are important they want to feel like they're being heard they want to feel like their opinions matter to people and having these kind of divisive issues um, be a platform for that is so beneficial for people who typically don't feel like they're heard in, in the media do you feel heard I feel heard. I, I have a bigger <laughs> platform than most, you know, being a part of UMTV to discuss these issues. Um, but I feel like students on campus, um, I don't know, specifically at the University of Miami. You, you anchor together. Yes. yes. We anchor the same show. Yes. Yes. The same show. Do you feel heard? Do you feel like that too? I think that especially with the rise of social media, particularly TikTok, where it's, it's easy for people to gain interest and followers and viewers based on one video, that Gen Z rising has been heard. You, there are people who are younger now taking roles in Congress. There, there's opportunities for people to get their voice out, get their message out, even if it's not through a typical media channel like print journalism. You know, that's, Tanya, the, the rise of social media, mm. and do you get your news from social media? I mean, Absolutely. You do? Yes. So do you feel like you are getting facts, opinion, perspective? How, how do you know what to believe? Okay, so I think, first of all, on campus, you know, so we have, we have, it's Florida International, so we have people from all over the place, right? Oh, South Florida campuses are the most diverse. Just, yeah. We have, sure. we have faces from everywhere. It's very interesting to be able to hear it from everyone. And so when it comes to social media, what I like to do is I have certain, I have notifications on for certain, uh, like, accounts that I can follow through. And then once I get that, I do my own research. I look up different things. I look up from different, from a wide range, just simply because how you said, how do I know it's facts? How how do I know it's not opinion? Cool. You know. Okay, great. I'm sure everybody listening is thinking, what a, what a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. How many people do you know of your peers? I'm just going to throw this out. You guys. <laughs> this is my dinner party. <laughs> Feel free to talk. Yeah. Um, how, many, how many people do that? Well, I think because well, our... By doing that, I mean how many people see something and then go do their own research right. from a variety of sources? I think it's more common than people think. Like I said, I think social media gets into kind of a, a team sports atmosphere, but because our generation has such a diverse media diet in different forms, we're also more media literate because we have, we've encountered either, you know, from the early days on MySpace of spam messages. MySpace, or, <laughs> MySpace seems like a lifetime, <laughs> a lifetime ago. ago. <laughs> right. But I mean, we've seen misinformation spread in a number of crucial ways that have impacted our lives. And How do you know it's, it's misinformation? We're, well, you have to do your research, right? It comes, it depends on the source it comes from. Yeah. It depends even from a reputable source who the source is in the article, right? It comes to a, a broader context of media literacy. I know that we're drilled into our heads as reporters that it's important not just to vet our sources, but to know their perspectives uh, when we include them. Do you, now do you watch news on television? Yep. As Carlton said, I think the age is, of social media. Is, is that a yes or yes, no? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I do watch local news. I watch national news as well. Um, I think we, we live in such an age, I, I don't know, specifically our generation. We've heard the term misinformation. We've heard the term fake news more and more. So I think it's, there's sort of a level of distrust when it comes to seeing immediately things and believing immediately what you see. I think it's kind of a 50-50 split. I don't know if I'm speaking for everybody mm -hmm. on people who will actually verify these types of things and not just take it at face value and believe it. I think we want to believe and trust that these news sources are things that we can take. Um, to heart, but at the same time, there is that level of distrust between do we know that this is bipartisan? Do we know that this is the full story? Do we know that this is what's actually happening? So there's two kinds of mis and disinformation, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's deliberate propaganda, which we see mm -hmm. and we're seeing in real time. And then there's a, a really heartfelt kind of reporter who just doesn't know what he or she might be talking about, which is equally dangerous. And, and so with that online, on the, on the air, everywhere, how do, you, how do you get your news? How do you act on what you hear? 
I think it's easier now when we're talking specifically about social media because say you tag an account, say you're doing a story about a person and you could tag their social media handle, you can go directly to the person's Instagram account, Twitter account, whatever it is, and see what they are saying in their own words in addition to the story as the reporter. So you can see what the reporter's saying about the story, you can see it from the source itself, and then you can also go to third party websites. It's easy to type in a username of a reputable news source in a search bar. And if you're on Instagram, just look up their Instagram and it's probably at the top of the page if it's a recent story. So I think it's really easy now for people to just quickly, within 30 seconds, verify whether the story is legit or not from a good source and a reputable news site. I think I'm kind of learning a lot from you all. <laughs> I need to take a quick break and we have some more to talk about. So sit tight, we will be right back. We are in the midst of a really good roundtable with the next generation of voters, all journalism students from University of Miami and Florida International University. And um, Regina, you are going to the debates in Miami, the presidential debates. You're going to be there personal or professional school? A uh, professional. I'm going with NBC. So it'll be oh, interesting. The networks that's sponsoring yes. the debates. Yes. So let's talk about um, the, the Florida people in the debate. We're a local station. We are focused on former President Trump, Governor Ron DeSantis, that whole campaign trail battling it out. And, um, and I'm just kind of wondering, I'm just going to throw out the big broad question. What do you see and what are you interested in when you hear that debate, especially between them and throw in some others if you feel like? Sure. Um, living in the state of Florida, this is the only time I have coming here for um, school. I think people are looking to Florida kind of as a legislative mix. There's a lot of things that Florida legislation has been doing that's been getting a lot of buzz in national news. And I'm looking for more legislation that's personal to me, more younger um, advocated issues, trans rights, AI, things like that that affect us on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes these debates can get kind of muddled in personal um, behaviors and personal things that these politicians have against each other and they don't really focus on the issues and the people that are their constituents so i really want to see a focus on people working for the people that you know they represent instead of personal interests that, that's an interesting mm -hmm. a couple of things that you threw mm -hmm. out because what i hear and especially maybe from some older voters is it's the economy mm -hmm. you yeah. know they don't they don't want to hear about the fights with disney and trans rights right. and ban but they they just want to know they're going to have money mm -hmm. and and is that a real genera uh, generational split? A and if so, why? Because mm -hmm. you need a good economy too, right? Well, I think I think part of the the issue, especially with with Governor DeSantis's presidential run, is that his highlights and are talking points, right? They're national, the war against woke, the war against Disney. Um, but in reality, he's done things that have helped, especially our generation, like he's invested significantly in the Resilient Florida Grant Program. Mm -hmm. He's done Everglades conservation, and it's stuff that probably won't come up on that debate stage because it's not the hot button issues. So in a way, it's, it's like we haven't felt heard about the issues that are important to us. The economy certainly is, is worrying for us, but right now we're, we're trying to get by. You know, that's, that's, um, that's an interesting point because the, he actually has brought up some of those, but when you talk about politics and personality, I mean, far President Trump, Tanya, he, he can say, I, I've witnessed him talking mm -hmm. policy, I've witnessed him cracking jokes, I've witnessed him bashing people. His audiences love it no matter mm -hmm. what. So is it is it going to be policy driven for you or, you know, in, in large part, people are entertained by that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel his biggest thing is entertainment. It's what can I get clicks? What can I get, you know, the the uh, the reaction that I want from my from my voters? It's working for him. He's it's a front runner. Yeah, it's yeah. that's I dare say that's the problem. So what the thing is, instead of focusing on issues, things that are for we're the next generation, right? We're the ones that are coming up. So I need to know. I need to hear that these are things are going to be helping me in my future. Right. So that's the things that I want to be listening to. And how she mentioned, it's mostly talking points. It's like pointing fingers rather than pointing fingers at what's going on and going future. So listening to it, I hope I see more of that. So, you know, what's interesting about talking points is because as journalists, we try to get people off their talking <laughs> points. But but talking points are a thing because it's a very effective way to be trained to get out your message in a very short amount mm -hmm. of time. Right. So um, do you then, Regina, do you vote politics? I'm hearing sort of a political spin. I probably could guess where your politics lie, but for you, is it a party thing or an issue thing? I think 
as journalists, you know, we try and be bipartisan. So I like to do it on policy by policy rather than just overarching person as a whole, because these are politicians. They have political agendas and stuff. But as journalists, we want to kind of tell a story as it is, not how as it should be, even if the politicians are trying to sway you one way or another. So I think for me, it's policy by policy. But at the end of the day, it is one person you're voting for. What about as a vote, not as a journalist, but as a voter? As, and, and OK, go ahead. Sorry, no, no. As a voter, I think it's the same way as well. I mean, at the end of the day, you're voting for one particular person, whether or not you agree with every single policy that they are planning on enacting. So you kind of have to go with who you align with the most, because there's going to be two front runner candidates, you have to pick one at the end of the day. And even if you don't agree with everything, you've got to go with who you think you most agree with and whose policies align with your well, beliefs. Why don't you, you know, you are among the engaged. Mm -hmm. Melanie, do you feel like your peers on campus, outside of your journalism classes, mm -hmm. are as engaged? And might they just sit home and not vote? I mean, we have local elections actually coming up this week mm -hmm. in four cities mm -hmm. in Miami-Dade. Why do people just not vote? I definitely feel like there's a lack of voting in local elections specifically because people don't see those types of representatives as important. You know, when they really are mm. making the infrastructure of the cities what they are. Wow, I think and people, the local ones could be the <laughs> most important. They are the <laughs> most important, but because national news is so marginalized all the time and it's what mm. people are seeing all the time, that's where all the drama happens. That's where people think mo the biggest decisions are made. So that's where most of their interest lies. I do think younger people specifically don't appreciate the value of local elections. I do think that my peers specifically do need to understand that a little bit more. Um, I would even admit that before becoming a journalism student, <laughs> I didn't know it as much. Well, why? Because are they boring? <laughs> Is it bo a boring thing? <laughs> I no, I'm being totally I, serious. I, just, just, I don't think it's easily accessible. Like they're having their uh. meetings and their board meetings. These politicians, the local politicians, they haven't come to campus. They don't come to, so University of Miami is in Coral Gables. I haven't had a politician come to Coral Gables or nearby kind of promoting what they're talking about, meeting Ooh. with students, which I think if they did, that would be incredible to them, but also beneficial to the students so they can know what students want changed and kind of get those votes and be symbiotic relationship. You were going to say vocabulary, I think another is the biggest thing. They don't talk in layman terms in a lot of, ah. in a lot of times. If I go to a college campus versus, you know, a normal de a, a debate, I'm not going to use the same words and so that's the thing how she said that it's not easily accessible just simply because if you come here telling me all these big words and stuff it's not going to it's not going to go into our peers as it would with layman terms so you're you're saying people should elected officials politicians meet you where you are mm -hmm. And know they got who you're representing is is basically what it is. Know who what she said. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> know who the people who are voting for you are. It's important that you gear your messages and gear your policies towards the people who are going to be putting you in office, and that includes younger people as well. And I think that's what a lot of local politicians overlook. Regina, Melanie, Carlton, Tanya, you are amazing, and I'm. I hope you will be back. This I'm, I may just have you back for more roundtables. <laughs> um, you'll see. I know you love to weigh in and text and email, and I want to hear that because I think you've provided some amazing insight. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for having us. So Thank yeah. you. We will be right back. To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan that QR code right there with your phone. Do it now. Go ahead. It'll take you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And you know we love your input and your feedback on everything we do here. Find us very easily via email or on social media at Glenna WPLG, Facebook, Twitter, X, Threads, Instagram, pick it. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Have a beautiful Sunday and keep in touch.